For whatever reason, I seem to always have a history of New Year's Eve going badly. One night I went out and got food poisoning, another time I got stuck in an elevator, one year I got stuck on a train, but I guess at least I never died on New Year's. The same can't be said for the characters in today's movie, the classic holiday slasher film, New Year's Evil. Actually the first film in this series that I hadn't watched previously, so you know, hopefully it doesn't suck. This video is sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is my favorite streaming service, it's basically the Netflix of horror. They're closing out the year with a stocking full of holiday horrors like Black Christmas, Better Watch Out, and new exclusives like the Advent Calendar. December also brings new sci-fi monster movie Death Valley, a new Last Drive-In special Joe Bob Ruins Christmas, new episodes of the Boulay Brothers' Dragula, and the season finale of docuseries Behind the Monsters, unpacking the surprising origins of Hellraiser's infamous Pinhead. This month, I'm going to give you my personal recommendation, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, a mockumentary that follows an aspiring slasher movie killer as he sets out to make a name for himself. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Vicious Fun, The Mortuary Collection, and PG, Psycho Goreman, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit Creepshow TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder free for 30 days, just go to shudder.com and use code WANG. Diane Sullivan, aka Blaze, is the star of a crazy punk rock New Year's show. And according to her assistant Yvonne, her bastard husband Richard is too drunk to make it. Yvonne notices a weird noise in her shower, and she dies sooner than expected. Even considering that she's a black character in an 80s slasher movie, like it really seemed like she was gonna have some more significance to the plot rather than just, oh hey, you know, just so you guys know, people die in this movie. The opening credits roll, and you got punks in a car freaking out squares. Like seriously, as corny as it is, this has gotta be one of my favorite 80s movies tropes, just the, the wacky, crazy punks freaking out squares. Enter Derek and get a load of this fit. At first I thought he was wearing a tuxedo t-shirt until I realized it was a tailcoat with the sleeves rolled up. You got powerful Hulk Hogan getting married to Dolly Parton energy here. And then he seals the deal with his outfit wearing dad jeans. Honestly, the biggest tragedy of this film is the fact that we never find out what shoes he's wearing to tie this entire outfit together. And my man Derek is really trying to mack it right now. But despite his immaculate drip, Diane doesn't really care about anything he's saying, least of all not the new movie role that he got. And this lack of attention makes Derek big angie. Oh yeah, and also apparently Derek is her son, so you know, we got a little bit to unpack there. So the New Year's show begins and listeners are calling in to vote for their favorite new wave song of the year. Suddenly, Diane receives a call from a wacky voiced man. Happy New Year! What's his name? Call me... Evil! I gotta say, Taka Michinoku did it better. We are evil! <laughs> evil does not have a vote for Song of the Year. Rather, he has a New Year's resolution. I'm going to commit murder at midnight. Now that I think about it, he kind of sounds a little bit more like Nails. And on that note, the band of Final Fight enemies plays their song. Check out that sick mosh. They're almost going harder than that yellow card wall of death. And note that we get an entire minute long sequence of music and mosh. After hanging up, Evil heads to an insane asylum where they are also very much enjoying the mosh in their own way. I'm sorry, but there's nothing to me that beats the way they depict crazy people in 80s movies. Evil encounters one of the nurses and pretends to be a temp named Jeff Winter. Yeah, I uh, always come well equipped. I bet you do. <laughs> I need a girl who looks at me like this after committing a massive HR violation. It turns out our man Evil is actually a master of the timeless art of seduction. We could find someplace private where we could share a glass of this before I punch in. Meanwhile at the show, after the threats, the LAPD comes to help. They tell Blaze to keep Evil on the phone long enough to trace him if he calls again. But in the meantime, Blaze calls to check on Derek, who is hopped up on gas station dick pills, and just as he's about to tell her something really important, she hangs up on him. And as midnight on the East Coast approaches... Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one! Happy New Year from New York City! 
guess he wasn't full of shit after all. Cut to another pointlessly long mosh sequence. Something I've always loved about concerts and movies, even now, is just it always looks like the people in the audience showed up for like five different shows. It's like they tell the extras just to show up looking like you're in some kind of subculture. Doesn't matter which one. This is evil. Evil calls back to inform Blaze that he did in fact keep his New Year's resolution with his first kill, which he plays the audio of over the phone. And we still got a few more time zones, which means we got a few more murders. As the body gets found, Derek is in his room watching the show and doing whatever the fuck this is. While this is all going on, Evil glues a porn stash onto himself in preparation for his next kill. We're gonna party like it's Vice City. And this guy does it again. Pure animal magnetism. The world is his oyster. So he convinces this broad to go with him to a party at Eric Estrada's place. But in the process of waiting for this girl to get done with the bathroom and then she brings her friend along, they wind up running late. And this girl just babbles on and on. Lisa got rid of her nervous diarrhea. Sally. And then I went to TA, you know, transactional analysis. Now I'm riding hikers. Day and night she talks. Each word more useless than the next. Would you please just kill her already? Smell. One. Happy New Year. Thank you. Death by suffocation in a bag of weed. Not the worst way to go, I guess. And after leaving the liquor store, her friend follows the trail. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. Blaze does not appreciate being played another death recording over the phone. What are Evil's thoughts on this matter? Shut up, bitch! The cops, searching for the body, narrowly miss Evil and head straight for the dumpster where they find... <coughs> a cat that for some reason sounds like Donald Duck. But then they find her. And on the kitty slide, death by being stabbed in the titty. It's almost time now for Midnight to roll around the third time. And Evil's now cruising wearing Jeffrey Dahmer glasses and a pre-shirt, seemingly looking for a nun. While driving, he gets into a scuffle with a biker gang who he tries to escape by driving into a drive through movie theater that's playing Blood Feast, except it's not actually Blood Feast, it's an entirely different movie that they called Blood Feast for some reason. And ultimately, his escape plan doesn't work. But... I not think that biker was anticipating getting stabbed to death by a priest. He then carjacks the guy who was touching a titty and drives off with his girl who very quickly realizes what the score is here. She offers money, her jewelry, offers to fuck him, but he's not interested. This is probably the actual most tense part of the movie as you have this character that's an actual sympathetic character that knows she's gonna die. And there's nothing she could do about it. Unless a couple drunk revelers create a distraction where the girl manages to escape. And we've got ourselves a classic slasher movie chased through the woods. And believe it or not, she manages not to trip. Instead, she finds a little hiding spot near some bleachers. Of course, though, her cover gets blown. But as Evil is about to go in for the kill, he's interrupted by the police. Meaning that the third midnight comes and goes with no killing. Despite the lack of a kill, police determine that Diane is most likely going to be the final victim. So they seal off the building, and the police have a psychologist that has evil all figured out. He has a compulsion to kill. This man is clearly a brain genius. I can just see that line being a sample at the beginning of a 90s death metal song. But more specifically, the psychologist has determined that this killer has a compulsion to kill at midnight. Which makes sense because, you know, he literally said that at the beginning of the movie. Although I do have to say the psychologist is really on the ball. He's mutilated the breasts of most of his women. That's a common characteristic of a psychopathic killer. Another common characteristic? The killing people. And also Derek's doing weird shit again. But with the building sealed off, Evil has to find another way to get inside. So it's time for some Metal Gear action. Hey officer, can you give me a hand over here? I think I found a drunk! And after equipping himself with the cop's gear, he's in. And it's time for one last costume change. We don't see what it is quite yet, though, so you know this is going to be an epic reveal. Meanwhile, Diane's police escort pulls some classic LAPD maneuvers and almost shoots Derek, who's not even doing his weird shit at this point, just laying in a bed. And rather than be upset that he just had a gun pointed in his face, he's more mad that his mother didn't come to see the big surprise he had planned. In any case, Diane has the police escort leave while she changes her outfit just in time for this cheeky little fellow to sneak in. <laughs> oh, Richard, you scared me. God. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right, the killer is her drunk husband, Richard. Although Diane doesn't seem at all curious how her husband managed to get into the sealed-off building, 
police think something's a little fishy. And sure enough, it turns out they found his Mercedes with the stabbed biker in the drive-thru, and also it turns out that he was a former patient of the mental hospital. So, you know, he's crazy. But his realization is too little too late, as Richard somehow hacks the elevator Diane's in with a screwdriver, sending it crashing to the bottom floor and knocking out the cop. Because, you know, that's how elevators work. And while he has her at the bottom of the elevator, Richard plays his boombox for Diane, revealing that he was the killer all along. Why would he do all this? Ladies are not very nice people. With a little more explanation about how she's also been not nice to their son, the final midnight approaches. Richard ties her to the bottom of the elevator with the chain with the plans to bring it all the way up and all the way down at midnight, crushing her. And he's gonna do all this with his handy dandy elevator hacking skills. Don't worry though. Diane's not alone. You see, keeping her company in the elevator is Yvonne's rubber head. Luckily for Diane, though, as that elevator's coming crashing down, the police catch Richard in the middle of hacking the elevator with his screwdriver and they start a shootout, and apparently the way you undo hacking an elevator with a screwdriver is to unhack it with bullets. The elevator stops, and with his plan foiled, Richard leads the police up the stairs on a chase to the roof. And now I'm saying this right here without me having actually finished the movie yet. I would be willing to bet a substantial amount of money that at the end of this chase, somehow, Richard winds up falling to his death off the roof. Don't even consider it, you scum. I guess it's time to pay up imaginary person that I made a bet with. In any case, Riccio did it better. Derek is sad that his dad, whose body is shockingly intact, is dead. But he leaves with his mask as a nice little souvenir. And as Diane gets wheeled into the ambulance, who's driving? Oh my god, Bear is driving! How can that be? No, it's not Bear. It's Derek in his dad's mask. Clearly, this was going to be the setup to the big sequel to New Year's Evil, which never came. Which makes a lot of sense, because this movie fucking sucked. Like, you guys know that I enjoy a movie that sucks, but I mean, this like sucked in a way that wasn't amusing at all. It really felt like a half hour short that got stretched into a feature length movie with overly long sections that don't really do anything to flesh out any of the characters, the story, or create any kind of tension or suspense. And despite that, the overly long music sections might actually be the best part of the movie because the soundtrack is pretty much this movie's only redeeming quality. The violence is extremely tame for a slasher movie, yet the quality of the filmmaking is good enough that it almost feels like they wanted this to be something more, and it's that level of quality that also prevents this movie from being a goofy fun horror movie. So if I were you, I would just skip this movie entirely. If you want a good New Year's movie to watch, watch Strange Days. But anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about Riccio, which features a significantly better person falling off a roof scene. I'm out.